welcome to uh, our coding, coding Creative Series for this year, 2024. And we are super happy to welcome as a first guest, Katie Duffy. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, for, joining, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to try to introduce what you do, but you do so many different things. So maybe you'll, you'll correct me afterwards, but you're a new media artist from Chicago, but now you are a professor in art and technology and culture at the University of Oklahoma. But you are also an artist, a designer, a developer, organizer, educator. So you're going to tell us about all that. Um, and yeah, we are looking forward to hear more about your, your practice. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for having me all. It's really nice to be in this uh, URL space with you. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and start my little presentation here. If I can locate my mouse. There she is. Yeah, it's working. We see your screen. Cool. So you see the whole slides? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. So as mentioned, my name is Katie Duffy. Um, I use they, them, their, they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, that's my website if you want to check out some stuff. Um, my Instagram and um, my uh, personal email if you want to follow up with any questions um, or tell me about like cool shit that you're doing. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm a assistant professor of art, technology, and culture. Um, I'm a co-director of a curatorial project called Ling Over Dicky Projects, and I'm one half of Code Lab, which is um, sort of like a, a writing project around um, like communities of coding and how to foster uh, more accessible communities of coding. So I'm like an artist, new media artist, designer, developer, writer, collaborator, organizer, curator, edu educator, anti-racist educator, um, and an abolitionist learner. Um, and that's a, a term I take from uh, this rapper I really love from Chicago called No Name. Um, she does a lot of work around abolition, but she positions herself as someone that's like still learning. And um, abolition is, is something that has just kind of come into the zeitgeist in the US. Um, so specifically like prison abolition and, and gender abolition. So that's a lot, of, a lot of what I write about as well. Um, so as mentioned, I'm like a lot of things. It's sort of annoying to have that many um, hyphenates and I just feel like it's obnoxious, but this is more of a representation of like who I am. I'm just kind of like a mess of all these things together. Uh, and it just like creates like one like weird lumpy practice that I'm sort of like jumping um, all around from. So to me, like all these like seemingly disparate things that I do, this is actually like my, my practice. Um, all right, so a creative coding journey. Um, so I'm a self-taught developer. Um, I ran into a lot of access barriers um, getting started with coding uh, in terms of just being like, I, I like was labeled an attitude problem person in undergrad. Uh, and it was just because I was like in a rural place and I was gay. And so like, um, you know, it, it was just like sort of hard for me to navigate a lot of these spaces. And I really got uh, started coding with like fucking around on the internet. Uh, and just having this interest in like customizing everything. So like, I don't know how y'all old y'all are, but like I had a little AIM messenger and I would like custom skin that. And I had like a GeoCities and like an Angel Fire account. And I was just like obsessed with like changing the background colors of things and like putting little avatars and GIFs all over stuff. Um, and I was also like a little terror baby engineer. Um, I would like rip stuff apart in my parents' house and like sneakily play with power tools. Uh, and just like make weird stuff. And um, my training uh, as an artist is that I was doing like really hyper-realistic um, paintings. And so, and, oh, and I was also a really good soccer player. Uh, I went to, <laughs> the only reason I went to college is because of soccer. So it sort of became aware that like I was, or in later life, I became more aware that I was like, just really kind of fascinated with like really specific uh, tech things, um, like technical things which like lent, lended itself well to like my self learning journey of coding. Um, and then I'll talk about this a little bit more um, later in the uh, presentation, but um, 
Oh, I missed, I missed a bullet. Um, I'm most interested in the mystique of the process of coding. You know, it's somewhat like, it seems kind of magical, especially to those that are like, maybe not um, super aware of the syntax and the structure and stuff. Um, and that's what really got me into it. I was just like, that looks really hard and I want to prove to people that I can do it. Um, and then I also like came out with the internet, like the internet was a space for me to like gender play online. And I'll talk later a little bit more about um, Legacy Russell's glitch feminism and how she sort of positions that. Um, and then I was just gonna read something really quickly from a text I wrote last year with my uh, collaborator, Alejandro Acierto. Uh, our collaboration is called Code Lab. And this was our feminist manifestex of coding. Um, so we are queer millennials who were born and raised in the city of Chicago. As a generation, we operate from a worldview mediated through digital technology platforms. Our indoctrination into computing was essential to our development. Computers served as intermediaries for accessing information and community. Being the first generation that was raised on the internet allowed for freedom of expression. Our self-making arose through the materiality of the internet. For many of us, access equaled workarounds. Equaled workarounds. We learned to work around barriers present by inadequate infrastructure, generational divides, and socioeconomic status. Against those obstacles, we had no other choice than to engage in a self-driven pedagogy. We immersed ourselves in hands-on explorations of new media. Fucking around with code and creating avatars allowed millennials to see ourselves differently in the world outside of the screen. Not only were we drawn to the computer screens in our family rooms, but we also became enthralled by what we could create online. Customizing our little corners of the web was possible using platforms like Tumblr, AIM, Angelfire, and MySpace. Customizing allowed us to be part of the actual formation of the World Wide Web, where its functionality had a lasting effect on visual culture. In this hyper-connected space, the high we got from code, making and code, uh, literacy enabled us to begin to share these experiences with other. The sharing spawned previously unimaginable configurations of identity and community, which defined us as a generation. So I'll stop there, but that's uh, the first chapter of our text. And um, don't let me forget to give you all a digital copy of that before I leave today. We love a freebie. And so here's our book. Um, last year it was a, an artist made book uh, published by Civil Press. Right now we're working on a, a book proposal um, where we have um, 15 artists uh, co uh, contributing to the text with essays. Um, and then uh, we're sort of doing like a rewrite of the, the manifest text. It'll be sort of like a second version and we are according like um, university press publishers for that. Um, and then here's just some information about like who we get our inspiration from for this text, working as the code lab. Um, and one of the main quotes that we really took and ran with uh, was from Charlotte Sines. Uh, how do I learn to we and how do we how do we rebuild with a we with wow I can't uh, read my own shit let me start over again <laughs> how do I learn to we and how do we rebuild a we with you in it and you know in our text we're talking a lot about code but we're talking a lot about access we're talking a lot about access barriers and we're talking a lot about like how to create. Um, more open-ended uh, imaginative communities for coding where people can bring lived experience and um, you know, their, their personal knowledge into the space without it being a hierarchical space of you know, who knows more of how to code. Um, and we really love pseudocode. We really, really love pseudocode as a way for everyone to participate in coding. Um, so this is sort of something from the text as well. Um, if it is true that you understand software systems and you are working in coalition or collaboration, then you understand systems of oppression. Looping through these systems with the variables of experience and identity, we test for we, and we increment our collective knowledge. We validates alternative modes of being and thinking. And then here's just some uh, pictures of our team. So we have uh, Tiffany Michael over here, it me here, and then Alejandro Acierto. Um, Tiffany's just a really badass uh, Chicago or organizer and engineer. And then um, uh, this is where we got the quote, understand software systems and you will understand uh, systems of oppression uh, by Sandy Castro, who runs uh, IC Stars, which is a um, coding training program on the South side of Chicago. 
Uh, and then we also give artists opportunities to work with us. So this is um, Chelsea Tomto's um, Trans Code Manifesto designed by uh, Jonathan Sangster. So two trans non-binary folks. Uh, this was actually included in the text. So like a folded up poster that you got when you uh, bought a physical book. And like I said before, we're soliciting a lot more um, collaborators for the second volume of, of the text. Okay, so now we can look at some art. Um, so these are like brand, brand, brand new things that I'm super excited to share with y'all. Like I haven't really shown these to anyone. And also I apologize for my documentation. I did this just for y'all. Uh, so I didn't have time to like super edit these. Um, these are definitely iPhone photos. So these are um, code-based drawings. So I have a little program that I wrote in um, P5.js. I also have a version of it in um, processing as well, where I just use like um, randomizers and modulators like sine wave, cosine, tangent, um, to sort of just like mix around shapes and um, come up with like kind of random, but like almost anticipated um, variations of for loops. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing um, like randomly generated uh, code-based forms. And then uh, what I do is I send them to my XY plotter and I plot them out with, um, with jelly roll pens. There was this thing in, I don't know, if I'm just talking about my experience in, in the US obviously, but in like sixth grade, uh, fourth through sixth grade, there was like a really big thing with jelly roll pens and like black paper. I don't know, like everybody, all the cool kids had it. And so it's like, it's really nostalgic for me to like work in this way, but it's also like really futuristic. So I'm really interested in the, in the space between like something where I'm pointing at a futurism, but also like feeling these um, notions of, you know, something kind of from my childhood. Sorry, let me turn off my uh, calendar here so y'all don't have to hear it beeping. And so I have a bunch of these. I did so many of these. I'm still working on them. So I just figured I would show you all a selection. And again, I thought the documentation isn't the greatest, um, but I, I will document them properly very soon. And so these are, these are all like, um, I like to think of them all as like cousins because they they spawn from the code. So, you know, I'll generate sort of like a randomized um, like schematic from the code. And then I'll take that one and I'll like glitch it out in another program and then send it through the plotter. So like everything's sort of from like the same base of code. So they all sort of like evolve and inherit attributes from each other as I continue to, um, to, to make them. So this is actually the, the first one that I made this summer. And then here's just some detail shots. And I've never, I've never done it on white paper before. So that was like, felt very experimental to me. Um, yeah, so that's just some of the samplings. I probably have like 25 of these at this point. Um, I don't normally work this way. I, I have been working with a gallery in Dallas and they are like really subtly, um, subtly telling me to make more commercial stuff. So I like sort of took their advice, uh, but it still felt like I was working in my own fashion where I just like to break shit and see what happens. Um, so that's kind of where these are, are standing right now. And just some artists I'm really, really inspired by. Um, I tend to be inspired by uh, like painters and installation artists. Uh, I started off as a painter and I, I still make installation. So um, I'm absolutely obsessed with Julie Meritu, um, whose work like means a lot to me. You know, she situates these works as like undulating geopolitical um, movements and uh, eras sort of like coming in and out of uh, real space and real time. And then uh, Abigail DeVille is a really important artist to me who um, she constructs these sort of like, um, what do I wanna call them? Like deteriorated spaces out of mostly found objects. Um, but I was actually at this show and like 
uh, this, this image really doesn't do it justice, but you kind of just get lost in all of the different like ladders and pieces and you kind of don't know like which way is up or down. Um, so both these artists I feel do a really good job of just like obliterating space. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to do with um, these is that I just want to, you know, I make the individual entities, but um, through like a layering process, I want to just like really kind of obliterate like the presence of like one form and kind of make it this almost like entity that kind of exists uh, based off of all of these different processes that I'm running in the background. Uh, and with these, I try to just like push them like right to the border of like hideous, like right at that border. Um, and then that's when I know I need to stop because as soon as they're kind of like getting to the point where they're going to flip to be like just kind of ugly and unsuccessful, that's how I know that I'm done. Because again, I like to I like to break things. And then uh, I'm also really inspired by Wengechi Mutu and um, Come Off Clint. Clint. Um, I have a, a Come Off Clint tattoo right here. And then I'm saving this arm for my uh, Wengechi Mutu uh, tattoo, which I'm getting this year. Very excited about that. So just some artists really near and dear to my heart. Like I said, I started out as a painter, so I tend to lean towards um, painters in terms of my visual inspiration, but I'm also um, I'm also heavily motivated by um, glitch feminism. If y'all have uh, seen this text, uh, Glitch Feminism, a Manifesto by Legacy Russell, I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, and uh, on the left here is a um, glitched out, I'm not really sure even what game this is, um, but it's a glitched out like just level of a game. And I'm really excited about like when you're gaming and you get like stuck in a wall and just like how it's just this like weird liminal space between you being part of the game and you being part of the infrastructure of the game. Um, so I'm really interested in, in sort of like the mistakes that come about uh, in digital spaces because I find them really, really beautiful and um, really challenging and really a, a completely different way to look at the material. Um, and then obviously, perhaps obviously the early uh, visualizers, music visualizers, this is like the first music visualizer from iTunes. Um, in high school, I used to just like, you know, chill with friends and like watch this for hours and hours. And I think it's just in the back of my head all the time. Um, and I'm also just really inspired by like glitch, just glitch in general. So like I have like thousands of these screenshots of just UI like glitching out on my phone. So this is, um, forgot where I was going, but it was telling me to take simultaneously like six different routes. And um, my AirPods are called Amy Lynn's AirPods. I bought them brand new. I don't know who Amy Lynn is. Um, but that's just the name of my AirPods. So I'm just like really obsessed with um, how a glitch occurs. Cause I, I, I collaborate a lot with these robots to make work. And I'm really interested in the fact that like a lot of the times the code that I'm sending to the robot is like too broken or too fucked up for it to like fully parse out. And so it just kind of like will, will print or send out these errors. And I'm really interested in those errors. And I, I also feel that way, like as a person, I'm just sort of like, I cannot compute totally. So I like working with these machines that also can't like fully articulate um, what is being communicated to them. So it's sort of this like back and forth between these misunderstandings that I have and like the misunderstandings that the machine has. And then I'll go back here um, to glitch feminism. Um, like I said, this is a, a huge influence on me. Legacy Russell is absolutely brilliant. Um, and just some things I wanted to say about glitch feminism is that, um, you know, for me, like errors open up possibility. Like that's why I'm obsessed with error because it takes you out of like the tidy space of making a product. I, I was a tech worker, I'm a recovering tech worker. Um, and I was just way more interested in like breaking shit than like making, you know, perfect UI buttons and stuff. So I got out of there pretty quick minus the um, obvious, uh, gender and race complications that happen in those industry industries, um, which we talk a lot about in uh, our code lab text. So um, like I said, errors open up possibility for me. And according to Legacy Russell, glitch refuses, glitch is com cosmic, glitch throws shade, glitch ghosts, 
which is error. It encrypts, it is antibody, which is virus, which mobilizes, which remixes and glitch survives. And I just really love, that's like a really tidy version of manifesto. Um, and I just feel like it really fits uh, perfectly with the work that I'm making. So I'm very thankful to Legacy for releasing this fourth wave feminist book. Okay, I'm gonna show this piece. Um, this clip is about uh, a minute and 20 seconds long and then I'll talk about it a bit. <laughs> So um, maybe as you notice, there's a lot of forms in that uh, video that are really reminiscent of the other forms that I'm using in my work. Um, and so not only do I want you to experience uh, these glitches, these forms, this sort of like, you know, obliviated uh, kind of mess of virtual experience in like a flat 2D image, I also want you to experience that in VR, like all of that stuff is like swirling around you and you're actually kind of like part of it. And I think a lot about like, um, you know, how like small we are, how how seemingly important we are as humans, but how like teeny tiny our lives are and how teeny tiny our planet is. Um, so uh, this piece is really just about this like ever expanding um, mini universe. Um, that uh, you know will never sort of cease to exist in the way that it is constantly like pushing against um, the space that it contains. So I think also think a lot about how like um, human evolution could have changed like on the dime. Uh, so I think a lot about these these forms that I make as like entities, uh, sort of semi sentient entities, because I'm I'm communicating with these um, programs like back and forth. They're sort of like making a logic. Um, some of them have a little bit of AI in them, and then I'm sort of making decisions based on what they're spitting out. Um, you know, and I think a lot about like how on an evolutionary plane, like, uh, you know, I have I have thumbs, but like the right conditions, uh, like one of us had to grow a thumb sometime and then like put the right conditions in the environment and in the culture, like had to exist for that thumb to become an adaptation rather than just a mutation. So I think a lot about like how all of this stuff could have played out like very, very differently on an evolutionary plane. And here's some of the, the specimens. Um, so these are some, some smaller drawings that I've done in the past. Um, some just weirdo scans and um, different articulations uh, made, you know, both on the plotter with the pen and both um, in uh, virtual space. Uh, these are what I would sort of refer to as the entities. And this is what I end up like plotting and then animating in Unity, which is what you just saw, Unity animation. Um, and these are all, like I said, these all like live in this really wild library that I have. Um, and they're all sort of mutations of each other. So like number one, you know, could be something like this. And then number two, if you could see these have sort of similar forms, like they're just sort of rotated around. So this would be like the mutation of this one. So in that way, all my work has this like direct relationship to it. So 
you know, it kind of has like a DNA, like I was just talking about with um, human evolution. Um, so I make a lot of web work too. Um, so this is a piece called Intelligent Belligerent um, that was shown at the Neon Heater um, in 2019, I guess. I don't, I don't know what happened to time. We like missed two years of life or something. Um, so these are just some stills from this work. And then, I'm sorry, I had it up here. There we go. So this is the site itself. Um, you click on, uh, well, first of all, you can see the whole poem that drives this piece by clicking on the little box here. Um, and I'll just read like a couple, couple stanzas from it. How do you navigate a system that is not designed for you? How do you navigate a system that you did not design? How do you navigate a system for which you cannot comprehend its means of creation? A big bang, a swipe of the screen, a design that is simultaneously intelligent and belligerent. It bends and twists your intentions into gestures, making you grasp for whatever footing or framework is available. Objections emerge for the purpose of expanding every possibility to an incom incomprehensible degree. So that's really about like what I'm trying to do with my work is like leverage that glitch and leverage that thing that's like ugly or not supposed to be there. Uh, and like, instead of, um, you know, instead of using that as like a negative thing, I, I use it as a positive paradigm for creating my work and also for working with my students. When I work with my students, like everything's hands-on um, and I'm really, really big into making to learn rather than learning to make. If you take a coding class with me, um, we don't sit around and talk about theory, um, we make stuff. And that's, uh, you know, my preferred way of working with students. So as you click on these numbers, um, the stanzas of the poem appear. And there's like five different scenes. Let me see if I can get to the next scene here. There's our next button. And uh, most of this is made in P5.js with uh, a little bit of like vanilla JavaScript. And I have an interest in type. I, um, my degree is, I have two degrees uh, in social work. And then um, also another degree in um, in digital art and design. So a lot of the way that I teach, there's like a huge social justice component to the way that I teach. I feel like it's really irresponsible to be talking about code and making with code without um, talking about the problematics at hand and the social justice issues that sort of follow. Um, so for instance, the other day I gave a lecture in my interface class about um, how you can trace algorithmic oppression and racism online back to the railroads in the US, like the transcontinental railroad. We laid the railroad and, um, you know, it was totally um, labor that was not um, like exploitative labor. Uh, many people died. Um, uh, and like they were aware of their conditions, they were working to unionize, but they laid the tracks. And then what happened is they pop, they fed the power lines along uh, the tracks. And then what ended up happening is that they laid the fiber optic cable along those same tracks. And so um, uh, the lecture posits that history isn't just something that happens like one after another, it's something that happens like on top of each other. And so because that happens, like you can't just get rid of the, you know, explicit bias and racism uh, of where, you know, that started because um, I forgot this person's first name, but Stanford University, um, you know, he found, he like kind of worked and founded Silicon Valley and then founded Stanford University. And he also worked on the Transcontinental Railroad and, um, he was a bigot, he was absolutely a bigot. And he, um, he like refused people entry into the school. And he like sort of educated this whole generation of 
um, developers that founded Silicon Valley. So you can't extract that from the, the code and the processes that we use today. And so I'll just show a little bit more of this. It has a special ending I'm trying to get us to. So this just finishes out the, the poem that goes with um, the text. And the text is, um, I'm sorry, that goes with the visuals. And um, when you click on the different uh, numbers, it uh, has a reaction um, to a specific number and plays the stanza for you. Um, yeah, and this is, like I said, this is all um, P5.js and a little bit of um, vanilla JavaScript. Uh, so let's move on to the next thing. How am I doing on time? Should I talk for like five more minutes? Um, yeah, you have five more minutes exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this would let me. Oh wait, I'm not on the presentation. I'm on the internet. Aha. I swear I have an MFA and I'm qualified for this. Sometimes the internet confuses me. <laughs> um, okay, so I think this is the last piece that I'll talk about. Um, this is a piece called Jurassic Warp. So um, there's a really great residency that I might recommend y'all check out. It's in Wisconsin. Um, it's really, really affordable. They uh, love international folks to come to it. It's called Acre. Um, and um, they, they pair you up with someone for a two person show after the residency. So I got paired up with this really amazing artist, um, Maria Luisa Sanin Pena. Um, and she was in Croatia doing her residency at the time. So it was really, really hard for us to find like internet that worked for her and to collaborate together. Um, and then like you were just sort of tracking uh, COVID like kind of coming towards us. And so long story short, the show ended up being canceled. Um, and so I scrambled to make a, um, a VR articulation of like a lot of the conversations we were having about like this sort of never ending waiting room of the internet uh, on Maria Luisa's side. Um, and it just became very fortuitous, not fortuitous, because I don't want to say that about COVID, but it became very relevant with COVID as well, because you know when it started, we had no idea when it was going to end. We had no idea what was going to happen. Um, so I'll show a little bit of this work. So we ended up using, like, do y'all know when you're on the internet and um, it's not working, but you can play that little dinosaur game? Um, I hope, I hope yeah. everyone knows that. Yeah. And so like the, so the dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. They, they know it. Yes. yes. Great. Um, so the dinosaur sort of became our like stand in for like, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I guess we'll just like mess around and, uh, you know, play these things, like find things to keep us busy through this time. Um, and then these are videos that ML created of um, dinosaurs, realistic dinosaurs jumping over cactuses instead of the, um, the sort of more cartoony ones we had. And so once you click out of those, that's gamified a little bit, you can click out of these uh, spheres of this office. Oh, let me go back, sorry. This video is moving too fast for me. I was wondering that. Okay, anyways, um, so you can click off the, um, the spheres that are like 360 images of an office. And then once you click the spheres, um, there's like two images of the office sort of like layering on top of each other and creating this glitch so that you kind of just get stuck in this never ending waiting room. And then, no, what's happening? I'm sorry. Ooh. 
just not want to let me move forward. Okay, I'm sorry, we'll watch this again. And so this room is just designed to be sort of like the chaos of, um, you know, everything that was sort of coming down on us when the pandemic started, like just not knowing what was happening. Uh, we also included a lot of features that like you find in the waiting room. So this is like this weird fountain um, and some like um, architectural elements. Here's how, here's the menu on how you click into the other screens. These are the videos that ML created of the dinosaurs jumping over cactuses. You have to actually like click, it's gamified. You have to actually like click out of these. Um, and they should be auto playing, but unless they're not. Um, so once you click out of these, you get into this never ending waiting room and you can like punch out these individual waiting room spheres. But as you can see in the background, it's like two layers of a 360 image, one moving one way and one moving the other way to create this infinite waiting room. And then this scene represents um, like the Wayback Machine, so like vintage web and how we like collect all of this, these vintage web products. Uh, and they're just sort of kind of like sitting there in history and stasis and not really being activated. Um, and so, yeah, this is really based off of sort of like vintage web and there's some interactive elements. You can click on the um, orbs and it just gives you um, Gives you like little phrases from the internet, like sort or not found, stuff like that. And then this is sort of my like mystical UI, uh, never ending space of the internet, always growing, changing. Um, like we got our glitched out UI, we have some elements that are sort of like mystical and ghostly. Um, and then you can sort of move through. So this really represents like the infinite space of. Uh, the universe and the internet, um, and then really just the unknown that we were finding ourselves in. Um, okay, so that's that. And then I think I'll just show like, um, so these are just some other uh, like cousins um, of the, the forms that I was showing. Uh, I make them into prints sometimes. Sometimes I make them into videos and prints. Um, this is a video made with the, um, with the forms. And then I have a real interest in like 3D printing and fabricating like alternative screens for the um, the, the code and the, uh, the print of the code to exist in. So I think maybe I will stop. Well, I'll show you this one. Um, is it okay to show you one more piece? Yeah, yeah of course. Okay, cool. So this is um, called Evidence of Our Own Primitive Nature. That's, this was at Ortega E. Gasset Projects in Brooklyn right before the pandemic. Um, so as you can see, like you see a lot of the, the same like cousin forms present in this. Um, and then what's on the screen. So there's screens behind these are um, uh, videos that I make kind of in the same process as, you know, just using these like modulators and um, random animators to take a lot of the um, imagery that I'm already using, like the specimens that I have and sort of like mix them up um, so that like what you're seeing on the video is reminiscent of the forms that you're seeing uh, made out of acrylic in space. I have a, like a little video here. And then the next step that I'm working on now is um, I'm going back through the sort of um, 3D printed cases and um, I'm making space so we can use the front facing camera and so that um, I can use some AR so that not only do the images like they're randomized and, and made through P5JS and processing, but now they'll be interactive as well. So they'll be able to recognize a face and recognize hands. Um, so as you walk past them and as the, um, the, the video inside of the device or the webcam um, sees you move by, it will sort of uh, collect like a random amount of shapes and forms and sort of um, 
like follow you as you walk past the screens. Okay, I think I'm gonna end there. Does that feel like a good time to end? Yeah, I mean, you you tell me, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, of course. Thank you so much for listening to me. Reactions, comments. I have maybe a really, this is more like a practical question. Yeah, yeah. But um, so, you know, the, the you, you, you shared at the beginning of your presentation that you were self-taught developer, you know, like you, you, you have to basically fuel your own practice, you know, to keep on learning. And, and I know that sometimes starting to learn code can feel so challenging, especially if you don't practice it. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe because we are in the middle of the creative coding class, maybe you could share some like tips or like any advice that you have, you know, into like keeping your creative coding practice going. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say I don't believe in failure. Um, I think uh, glitching and hacking and breaking code is a real way of learning. Uh, you know, it's actually like a, a positive learning paradigm. I try to employ that in all of my classes because um, I don't ever want students to be, I don't want syntax to hold people back from being able to make things that they want to make. So um, I would highly encourage you all to just like get in there, change those numbers on those variables, um, you know, plug in some stuff that you don't think is going to work uh, and just kind of break shit. See if it see if it deploys, and then um, you know follow the error messages in the deployment, and it'll tell you actually like what's wrong. So you can go back to like line seventy six and be like, oh okay, it's saying I'm missing a bracket. So you can add your bracket there. So that's like really how I learned was this sort of like reverse engineered version of coding. Um, and then I think also what I'll say is that um, as an artist, like I'm sort of like a multidisciplinary person that fucks with code a lot. Um, for me, it's it's more about like the project. Like, so does the project call for being coded? You know what I mean? Like, is this, is there some other way that I can like articulate this that isn't, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be a great developer to do something that looks like really interesting, right? So like for these videos, I'm just bringing in um, forms that I've previously animated just with like the video library and processing. And I'm literally just like layering them and putting different blend modes on them, you know? So like, it may look really fancy, but it's probably like three, four lines of code. Same with my randomized, randomizing generator, um, which I'd be happy to send y'all um, if you would wanna mess with it. It's pretty fun. You just change the values around um, and it just will spit out different, really beautiful motifs. So um, yeah, I guess I would say like, don't be afraid to like really fuck up because I feel like when you when you crawl out of like that hole, that's when you learn the most. And um, I'm, I think I said this already, but I'm all about like making to learn rather than learning to make. Like we're never gonna do a theory lecture in my classes. Like I want my, the people that I work with in the classroom to just like jump in and uh, get some experience and get going and get them really comfortable with like accessing, um, you know, the documentation, right? Because I feel like that's the hardest part of uh, learning a new language is just being able to like read the documentation. So um, I would say if you get good at anything, uh, it would be figure out how to use those documentation pages. And then um, you can start plugging things in in ways that you didn't think you could because the documentation pages will really, really explain to you what's happening. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it did. It totally did. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, it, it really And like, just don't be afraid. Like, you know, I know that's not how it works. Like, I just tell you, like, don't be afraid and then it's fine, right? But like, um, I just really encourage y'all to like, just, just fucking go for it, you know? Like, and I, and I find that like, in my classes, um, I get a lot of, I get, I get people from computer science. I get people that have never coded before. Um, and I find that the people that have never coded before end up making the most interesting stuff in the class because they're not bogged down by how code's supposed to be or how you're supposed to do things. You know, I feel like the people that have um, not a lot of experience, like their expectations are different, you know, and so they can kind of set out and see things from a different perspective. And I think that allows them to make some of the most interesting stuff in my classes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Any any questions or reactions, comments? You can ask me anything. You can ask me about like what it's 
how I pay my bills. Well, <laughs> you know what? That's actually good. Good. <laughs> Yeah. I have a question. You said at the beginning that you had the training in hyper-realistic painting. And I was wondering, yeah. do you also do that? And how does it fuel maybe your practice today? How do you combine maybe the two? Because it sounds so like different world, but Way, yeah, so. totally. It is it is like seemingly a totally different world, but I think um that was like that was what art was for me, you know, like in high school, like was like painting. That's like what you got in like maybe like a I would, like mess around and make, you know, uh early graphic design projects like we were making um maybe this is aging myself. But we were making like covers for CDs and, and stuff like that, you know. So there's a lot of stuff like that, but I realized that in, you know, throughout my life, I've been really, really interested in, in super technical stuff. So like um, taking apart my parents' phone and putting it back together or like, you know, making a really elaborate tent in the yard or um, I was a really, I played center mid, I was a really skilled soccer player and I had, and I, I really had like a really, really tight painting style. And I didn't, I didn't realize this at the time, but I think all of these things led me to syntax, right? Led me to like this really highly specific way of making where um, you need to have like a lot of memorization and a lot of skill to make something happen. And, you know, all of those, all of those endeavors for me for, were really creative. Like being a soccer player was like, felt super, super creative to me. So it like fueled um, like what I do as an artist now. And, you know, as a painter, um, that's what got me into video was painting. And I was like, oh, I, I really want this stuff to move. Like, it's not, I don't want it to be static. I want it to move. And then I had this professor who was really generous who would like sit with me and help me use oh my god again dating myself final cut pro um and i would just like sort of tell him what i wanted to move around and um he would drive and i would kind of direct and that's how i like learned that was like my gateway drug into coding does that answer your question yes thank you and maybe just that as, as a final question because you you touch on it, but you tell me if you don't want to, you know, I think we, we tend to like talk about like, like the, you know, like practicing and, and the theory, but we never actually talk about how you, you know, survive as an artist or how, how as a designer and um, like maybe because you, you were also a developer, like you worked in really more like corporate yeah. environment and then you made the jump from that world to a more, I, I guess, um, personal practice or artistic practice could you maybe if, if if it's okay with you like maybe share you know like how how did you do that you know like how do you um make that jump because it is a pretty big leap that can be also sometimes scary yeah so i, I went to um so undergrad i like i said before i studied um social work and like digital design and where I kind of ended up working and like the, the projects that I did and like um, what's called, not to insult anyone's intelligence, but what's called AmeriCorps in the US. It's like, it's real problematic, but I didn't know that at the time I was, you know, small and a little uneducated, but it's just like this program where you go and you work in like communities uh, in, in, in like my appointment that I got after right after college, I stayed where I went to college and I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of just art classes for kids that went to like alternative high schools and stuff like that, you know? So I got to, got to kind of combine those two things. And after a while of doing, um, doing that kind of work, like sort of um, social justice work with like video and coding skills and stuff like that, I decided that I, I wanted to go to grad school because I wanted to explore that more deeply. Um, so I went to grad school and in grad school, I remember I made a painting, uh, like the first week and I had a, a studio visit with my director and she was just like, why are you painting? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Why are you painting? I didn't, I didn't bring you here for that. So, um, yeah, I, I just started working on like more media and like teaching myself a lot more how to code and, um, I paid a lot of money for that school that I don't have. I come from like, by no means poor, but like paycheck to paycheck people. And I like bought my way into this fancy college with money I'll never pay back. Um, so that's being realistic. And um, 
yeah, after college, uh, after grad school, I, um, I took a job at a, a tech company, a startup tech company called Blam City Lights. Uh, we had like a proprietary software that worked, uh, sent um, like uh, microwave audio signals through click tracks for live performances. So there could be like special light shows on phones. Um, so I was a front end developer for that. And I was also teaching like two classes adjunct at two different schools in where I was in Baltimore at the time. Um, and I was like barely making it, paying my loans, paying my rent. Um, and I was just tired and kind of grumpy all the time. And then I got lucky enough to, well, I realized that um, tech wasn't really the environment that I wanted to be in. It was really rough to be there as like a queer femme. Um, there were a lot of problematics. So I won't go into those, that's a whole nother talk. Um, but I decided to leave and I decided to pursue education full-time because for me, it meant that I just got, got to keep learning. I got to keep growing as an artist and like working with young people and like their ideas. So I adjuncted for another two years and then I got really lucky to get um, a full-time tenure track job. And now I have my second full-time tenure track job. So I was in Chicago before this and in, uh, now I'm in Oklahoma. Um, but like paying bills has always been an issue. Even, even like having this position that I have, I always thought being a professor was like really prestigious when I was younger, but like I make like 60 grand US a year, you know, that's like not, and I teach computer science classes like in this art department, but I get paid like a artist, you know? Um, so it's not the most lucrative career at all. Um, I'm lucky to be at an institution that um, funds like a lot of my travel and will fund a lot of my materials. So I'm taken care of in that way. But um, yeah, if you sort of choose to go down this route that I've gone down, um, you don't make a ton of money and, uh, and shit's tight. Like shit's always tight. You know, I'm always sort of scrambling to get more funding and, um, you know, just using anything I can find uh, any of my, uh, faculty folks that have like any type of equipment, I'm like, can I use that? Can I have that? Like, I'm just like a scavenger because I need to be, and I've always, always had to be that way. Sorry. I think I got a little off on the No, no, the it's, no, I think, no, it's, you know, it's, it's, thank you so much for your yeah. honesty. And, you know, I think your talk was really generous and I thank you very much for that because I think yeah. We, we tend to avoid those type of really um, honest conversation, you know, I feel yeah. in, in, so I try when I can, you know, to bring those topics uh, when people are willing to talk about it. So um, thank yeah. you so much. I, it was, I think it was the- One, one other thing, if you don't mind, one other thing I'd like to add is just that like, I was definitely living like that hustle lifestyle for a really long time, just that like nose to the grind lifestyle. And um, now I'm focusing on, uh, more high quality opportunities and I'm taking naps. Uh, so uh, <laughs> trying to like get self-care in there because I've, I've really been doing that grind thing. I'm 35 now and it's, uh, it's not really cute anymore. So, um, you know, I'm probably, probably going to get notice that I got an uh, opportunity for an installation and have two weeks to make it and I'll bust my ass to do that. But like now I'm at the point where, um, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to take care of myself and find spaces for that and find communities for that. And I find that like, I'm better at making art and I'm a better educator when I just like slow the fuck down. Also my ADHD medication helps a lot with that as well. Um, yeah, so I think those are my, my I'll leave you with, <laughs> I'll leave you with that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you. It was really, it was really great to get to to know you more. Like I, I follow your work, but it was great to have this opportunity to uh, hear you talk about your work. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much for having me, y'all. I, I really, really appreciate it, and I hope y'all have a a really successful semester and um, yeah, a lot of success to you moving moving on from your degree. Well, maybe like we can share some of the results from the creative coding class if you want. I can just yeah. like send you. So I would just, yeah. I would like really 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 love that it would warm my heart please do okay that. great then then we'll do that we'll uh, we'll send you the results so you can have a look of what they've been doing cool Thank oh and then so really, I'm sorry before I, you know what I'll just email you I'm going to send you the um the manifest x it's a digital oh copy. yeah thank you so much and yeah. then 
I'm also going to send the um, randomizer processing sketch. So if y'all want to mess around with that, you can. Oh, amazing. Uh, yes, yeah. I will definitely make sure that they, they all have it. Thank you so much. Okay, amazing. Y'all take care of yourselves. You this too. was really fun. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 <laughs>